it's fun. And, and I think it's an extension of the work that I do that, um, um, that I can at least share something, you know, not everyone can afford an elaborate, you know, floral arrangement, bridal bouquet, not everyone can have um, a, you know, desert garden, uh, rare and unusual woodland plants from Asia, like whatever it may be, not everyone can have those, uh, but they can have pieces, they can have, you know, bits and pieces that they can, um, um, they can, you know, they can, you know, take and look at that's a part of this realm as to say that, hey, you know, when the, you know, the time and place, you know, is right, this exists. And, and that uh, you're going to be welcome in this, in, in this space. This is Cross Pollination. I'm Carrie Preston. And today I'm talking to Riz Rees from RHR Horticulture in Seattle. I met Riz several years ago while traveling in the Pacific Northwest. I was struck by his work, his plantsmanship, and his deep passion, but also and mostly by his beautiful empathy and humanity. Riz was named one of Greenhouse Gart Growers Magazine's 40 Under 40 of 2021. And in 2019, he was also chosen by the American Horticulture Society as an emerging horticultural professional. Riz and I talk about his work at McMenamin's Anderson School, a former junior high school which, with expansive parking lots that has been transformed into a hospitality center with eclectic and frankly exciting gardens full of plants and experiences you rarely see in that type of context. We also talk about what drives him and his search for meaning and stories and connection in all that he does, whether it be a garden, teaching, or giving a single flower to a stranger. Riz is someone who is helping make gardens accessible and exciting and open to everyone. But can you explain what McMenamins is and what their concept is in general? Sure. So um, it's just a spiel I have to uh, <laughs> to give often, which is fine yeah. because it's a very unique, I have a very unique, um, well, the job isn't unique, it's pretty straightforward, but the company is unique, let's put the it that way. The concept of the company um, is pretty cool. Yeah, and I think it's uh, something that I think a lot of future businesses can certainly adapt because um, we've been able to adapt even through this pandemic as challenging as it's been, but it is a, you know, boil it down, it is a hospitality company, restaurants, hotels, etc. cetera. Um, so um, it's a company based out of Portland, Oregon. And um, they initially started as uh, a neighborhood pub and uh, two brothers that like making beer. <laughs> and so- you I'm so uh, Portland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you've been to Portland, yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, from there, um, they thought, oh, this is really successful. You should open a few other pubs. You should start serving food. Okay, the restaurant comes in. And then it just became the staple um, within the um, Portland region. Uh, and it just built from there, investing in uh, historic properties. And um, so they either uh, former schools um, that were you know, old buildings that have been abandoned and basically brought them back to life as a pub, as a restaurant, or um, if it's large enough, as a hotel. And, uh, and so they became almost like these resorts. And then, um, so we have these kind of key properties, mostly in Oregon and of course in Washington where I live. And they um, then began to provide these experiences for their guests because they discovered of course that um, once you are in a space and you keep your audience engaged in that space, um, uh, they want to spend money. So um, that's kind of the, the, you know, the general concept, um, the business side of it. But it's also, like I mentioned earlier, an experience for people to come in where, yeah, they expect a restaurant, a bar to have a drink. And then, oh, there's artwork in the halls of the hotel. There is a pool, there's a spa, there's a, um, you know, my realm, gardens. So a lot of their larger properties, like the Anderson School that you went to, um, uh, has extensive gardens, and it's something that they certainly value as a company. Um, they see it as an important um, you know, a way to sort of engage, uh, you know, people. Anyone, you know, are uh, there's no, you know, 
barriers, gates. It's all open to the public for people to wander around. But even you know, people uh, who aren't patrons are always welcome to come onto mm -hmm. the property and wander. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's a place to just wander and look and uh, people are always sort of confused as to what this place is. And then all of a sudden they discover, um, you know, they peek through a window of one of the buildings and there's a bar and there's a restaurant. So, um, so it's like this know, experience people... and then there just happens to be this place where you can get great beer and happens to be this place where you could spend the night and these types of things. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so it's a, it's, it's a, a, it's a pretty neat concept. What struck me when I was visiting you is that, so it seemed like the Anderson school was like this traditional school at one point with like way too many parking lots, like every American school. And I, and I imagine like, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm sure they could probably do this in old malls and strip malls. And I'm sure they are. And that they like, really just took this infrastructure of this like overly parking lotted location and like cut out asphalt and made gardens into an existing infrastructure. Hmm. And I thought this is genius because um, because there's so many places like this that you, they sort of feel like asphalt deserts. And I found it so deeply inspiring how like they didn't like break it down. Like they kept the existing buildings and then they just like cut things out and added it and created intimate spaces in this place that before was clearly not intimate. Yeah, yeah, um, yep, exactly. I think uh, it's interesting you mentioned that Carrie because I was thinking of that yesterday as I was um, weeding and, um, and pruning our roses yesterday, how um, I get to work in this space that could have been um, yeah, asphalt that could have been um, just an annual you know, um, turf lawn. We actually don't have turf, which I'm so grateful for <laughs> um, because I don't have to, you know, mow and deal with all that. But yeah, I just realized that how much space they, you know, sacrificed uh, for um, for gardens. I'm willing to take the parking spot, you know, uh, further away sort of situation. But um, but yeah, the mentality is still people want to go to point A, point B. And, um, and that's actually influenced a lot of our, uh, uh, the, the layout and the design of the gardens as well, is to what, um, observing how people move in, in space and, um, and uh, trying to, you know, to, to capitalize on that and also, um, you know, protect our, our plantings be, uh, because of that. So uh, it's been an in, unusual dynamic. So do you find like certain bits of the garden, like people, don't want to have to go around and look cut through and so you'll just make an opening there and just yeah i mean we've tried to it's always sort of a fight internally because there's um there's only so i feel like there's so much you can do with plants of course and uh, you know and structure and, and whatnot um but um sometimes you just lose that fight because it's a very common uh cut through and then you begin to step back and observe okay you know why is that you know uh, happening you you have to observe you know every other day just go and see when it gets busy what the natural trajectory is what are they drawn to and then when you can identify those things then you can sort of begin to like okay well let's you know let's make a modification and can you give some then, examples of, of things that have like like did you try something out knowing let's see if this works can you give some examples mm -hmm. of this oh I, yeah yeah I, I just thought of one actually the best example is um, our desert garden actually um which we wanted to just feature this large um, mass of uh, planting, this large planting bed of hardy uh, succulents and drought tolerant plants. And of course, when we first put it in, um, there's a lot of empty negative space there until plants filled in and uh, things that, you know, that we seeded in that, you know, would finally take, um, take off. So naturally, people will still look at that and, and think, oh, there's a space that I can cut through. They, you know, think it's a space like, oh, it's all just rock, you know, I, I, I can just step into here. So we would strategically place um, either plant material or rocks, or we have a ton of, um, of wine barrel rings uh, from wine barrels that have been oh, yeah. deconstructed. And um, so, because we have uh, uh, wineries as well in some of our properties. 
And so uh, we would, you know, make those spheres and different ornaments, and we actually, um, uh, you know, place those um, in a way where uh, maybe this will, you know, give the impression that, uh, yeah, oh, I really can't walk through here, um, but then they still do, and you know, they find their way around. It's just like, okay, what's going on? Um, and then you do a, you know, a little bit of that until you reach a point, okay, I see that there's a path associated with this bed here. Naturally, they're gonna want to go here no matter how much I block off this space. Like how um, many wine barrels and cactus I put here. <laughs> yeah, and like we even have signs too, like please be careful, plants are spiny, da 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 da. Um, but you somehow they just, they, no. And that's one, another thing too, like we'll have signs up and I'm like, this is stupid, <laughs> you know, but, um, um, but yeah, you're, you're right. You know, uh, people don't read. So you have to pay attention to these, um, you know, to visual cues that they could be looking at. Um, but a lot of it you can just really direct. So if you have an intended path, that's right there, start from that space and then gradually you know, guide them. And, um, and in a way it worked out well because we basically cut this desert garden bed in half. So by having a pathway, then they can have a little experience as they go through. They're gonna cut through Thank anyway. You more, yeah. Exactly. So then we began to develop the edges of that um, of that bed with a few more you know interesting uh, plantings um, and uh, a little discrete um, um, sign for uh, interpretation. Um, and then we also changed the color of the path too because everything was top dressed with granite, That's uh, crushed granite. And then uh, I brought in a crushed uh, lava rock um, as um, uh, as the path. So you have a distinct um, like, okay, if this is enough. Like then something's wrong with you, <laughs> you know, sort of situation. But um, so yeah, that's how we uh, we solved that issue. But this is this is this is a great this is a great way to be able to design. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That you're not just like doing it on the drawing board ahead of time, but you're mm -hmm. you're creating a sort of master plan that you adapt and tweak as you're seeing it's how it's being used. Yeah, and that's exactly what my boss did before I started uh, with this position. He uh, drew out the master plan for the site, and then when I was hired in, we worked together to to tweak it. And and so many things had to change because it was the process where, um, and it's something I kind of dislike about how we do our gardens because it, they happen so fast. It's not like we wait for the construction to be over and then we have, okay, now we can move in and do our stuff. It happens together. And, oh, that's, uh, and that? Cause uh, that's like the dream that we, like every landscape designer hopes that we'll be invited to come before it's all done and we just have to fix things. Like what? what? So I wish I could have, have adopted that mentality because <laughs> I was just like, I'll do something. And then they're like, oh, you can't do that. Cause we have to move in this equipment. I'm like, Okay. Dang it. You know, that sort of thing. And of course, when you're the landscaper or the designer or whatever, and you're working with construction folks, you know, you just get the stink eye the whole time, you know, it's just, you know, like, why are you here? You know, like, we're trying to get our work done, you know, why is the, you know, the designer, like, you know, like, what uh, this sort of thing. So it has taught me to, and I'm still working on it, uh, assertiveness. And um, and then yeah, and, and learning to work and, and to compromise and um, and you know because you're all after the same goal. You're both just trying to get your job and your work done of what your um, your your superiors are expecting from you. So um, it's I think having that mutual understanding, having that mutual you know respect for the work that they do because like I, I that that's a skill set that you know I don't possess. And um, so it's um, helped me sort of let go, even though we had something on paper, we had our plan, like, okay, well, what can I do on my end um, to modify um, that'll allow them to do what they do, but still adhere to, you know, my vision, I guess, and what we want to attempt in this particular space. And if it's something that's non-negotiable, I need to be able to, you know, to really express and explain to them that, Hey, I really can't have you driving your equipment through this sec to, through this area. Um, is there any way we can, um, uh, you know, reroute you because there um, there is a tree here and we need to protect, you know, the the tree roots because they could care less about that sort of and thing. And do they have you starting so early because they want at the opening the plantings to be lush and to look all great? Good question. Um, 
Luckily, no. I, they have an understanding that before grand opening that they would have um, little plants, that there will be young, you know, some good things to look at. So we, you know, we ordered in a lot of uh, mature specimen trees and that sort of thing to build the bones and the framework of the garden. But then um, like the meadow, for example, the desert garden, like I mentioned, and other areas. Yeah, you know, uh, you, it's the fresh recent install um, that, you know, we're all accustomed to when we first put in a landscape. And they uh, they understood and expected that, so they didn't expect you know the um, you know billowing pots and um, and annual you know color and all that sort of thing. Um, but because um, yeah, even during grand opening, um, you know the, they had the bagpipes going and all this sort of stuff, like we were still planting our meadow, you know, it was just like, yeah. this is awkward, you know, there's guests here and, you know, and they're starting to serve food. And um, so it was awkward, but it was just, you know, just really? roll with it. Yeah, it's real. <laughs> well, and I think especially with um, a drought tolerant planting, that tends to take a little bit longer to establish. It, um, it can, unless um, you have the resources to plant densely, which I wish, uh, you know, and we sort of did, you know, we were able to splurge on a few uh, key specimen plants. And then we also knew that, uh, yeah, that it was grand opening and it was going to be a featured really unique garden um, that uh, most people wouldn't expect here in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, let's make it a highlight. Um, and, um, but yeah, we, we, we could have planted densely, but you're right, it does take a while. Um, and to help with that, um, because the plants in a, in, a, in a desert garden, in a drought tolerant garden tend to be very architectural. So you have these sort of focal elements, but then there's the in-between. And for the time being, that was just, you know, the granite, you know, top dress that we did. Um, but then over time, we began to introduce a few perennials, um, you know, the grasses, I had my bulb order come in. And um, so yeah, come spring, we would have, you know, a show uh, for, uh, for, the, for everyone. I had the impression when I was visiting that you had a lot of freedom to play and like, follow your own horticultural vision how how mm -hmm. how yeah how did that go like so when they drew the master plan like did they say hey let's make a desert garden here or was that your idea and then and and also like were was it was it completely free reign like hey Riz we want this to be a desert garden whatever you want to plan is up to you like how, how does that work yeah, um, it's a great process, actually. It's probably a dream of any plantsman to get this kind of gig where um, you're basically given a, a framework and then, uh, all right, just, you know, we're going to add cool plants to it. And so what do you like <laughs> kind of deal? And I'm like, whoa. So it wasn't quite like that. I'm kind of simplifying it, but. Um, I mean, it seemed a bit like that when I visited. I was like, wow, <laughs> this is like heaven kind yeah. of because you had all well, sorts of cool plants. It definitely helps that I have a boss that's also a, an uber plant geek. Um, so his name's Eric Petschke, and he is um, our corporate gardens manager. And um, so he, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, designed the, the master plan for the site. So he decided where certain garden features were going to be. He decided where that desert garden was going to be. And he got to the point where, yeah, he did the grading. He did all these things, and it's remarkable because he's not even um, formally trained in horticulture or landscape architecture at all. He's just a self-taught um, individual, and um, he's, I know, he's I brilliant. I think sometimes the best gardeners really are self-taught. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. You know, they're more in tune and they pay attention to you know being outside, being in an environment, and um, and certainly you know in, in tune with that. And so, yeah, I think we worked well um, together. So, cause he gave me this framework of where certain garden features were going to be. And then, uh, yeah. And then I just came in with planting designs and then we kind of went back and forth. And he kind um, of pays it and, mm -hmm. and says, yeah, that works. Exactly. And are you given like, sort of like, and if this is too much detail, tell me like, are you given like a budget? Like, okay, for this desert garden, you have this budget as long as you stay within that, that's fine kind of thing or? So um, interesting, um, he had so many things sort of lined up already for the site, including plant materials, hardscape, like can he work with a contractor to um, basically get all that, those things settled. Um, a lot of the larger trees, you know, he had ordered in 
and he and we also grew a lot of they before I started um, grew a lot of plants the, in house for this project. Mm. So a lot of the plants for the meadow, for example, were grown from seed from various sources around the world, um, and uh, things were propagated for the site from the different properties. Um, so there was a really a lot to work with when I was there, and um, so he basically gave me this inventory or this. Um, a sheet of the plants that have been designated for this project. And then he's thought, okay, well, we'll use these here and then we'll use these there. And then, well, what about this? Where do you think this will fit? You know, so it was just a, that kind of conversation. So he really laid it out, you know, really well, you know, for, for me when I, when I started. Um, but then I also had a say in terms of, um, uh, having been in that space now and then uh, you know a little bit of construction has been done and then you can, can step back and like oh, okay i think you know we, we can make this um, um this sort of thing work but it all happens so fast uh, you know sometimes you don't even have an opportunity to just sort of think where um some a plant gets a tree gets unloaded somewhere and and you know it doesn't even move once it's come off the truck and it's like okay i think it'll just work there <laughs> because you have to like you just have to like work fast because you know there's like um you know uh equipment coming by like there if you don't make a decision you know this is it kind of deal so it's really nerve-wracking it's um oh it's it's like you know flower show you know <laughs> philadelphia flower show i think it is a lot where... like a flower show yeah yeah I, I i i had a similar kind of experience at a flower show that I did in 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 Moscow, where they just mm. like they wow. had they had ordered something for me and it wasn't quite what I wanted, but it was kind of what I wanted. And they were just like, Carrie, we have this. We ordered it. You got to use it. Make it work. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 And I think um, it, it, sometimes people don't expect that. You know, when I you know did garden show you know years ago, um, I think having that flexibility, being able to adapt. Um, and we knew it was hard, it was very uncomfortable, but at the same time, you know, you really just had to, you know, to, to roll with it. And I think um, and sometimes I think designs get better because of it, because you mm -hmm. come up with solutions that you otherwise might not have. And mm -hmm. so you keep discovering new things. Yeah. And like, especially with that garden design, like I not almost all the plants I wound up using were different than what I had intended. And I was like, wow, Portulaca really works as a ground cover, you know? So you know, you, you discover new things. So it, it, it's not Absolutely. comfortable, but it's good. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's one thing I, you know, would instill in students, you know, if, um, when I teach is to, um, yeah, embrace being uncomfortable. I mean, and it's, you know, it, it's a part of the gig, but at the same time, that discomfort also, you know, uh, they have to trust that it's going to lead to an experience that, uh, you know, will make things easier or, um, or you learn from a new skill from it. Um, it's part of paying your dues, I guess, is the way, you know, you could, I could, you know, it's a way to put it. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's challenging, but you're right. You do, you do learn. How did you come on board? Like, did you, did someone know work you'd done? Like, how did that work? How did they find you? Um, so, uh, have you met Sean Hogan from Sistis Nursery? Um, yeah, so uh, Sean and I, you know, years, really good friends, and of course, you know, I love the nursery, and, um, and you know, have so many plants, you know, fr from Sistis, and um, he actually recommended me to Eric uh, when Eric was looking for the gardens manager for this position. Um, and um, so, yeah, it, it, it started there. So very grateful for it. And of course it works out because, you know, we buy plants from, you know, from so many plants, you know, from, from Sistis. So there's this, there's already a history there. And um, so, yeah, it was great. You know, um, when I first went down, when I first started the job, I went down for my orientation in Portland. And then I noticed on our last day was we were going to go see vendors and, um, you know, that I had to be familiar with because I'm going to be working with them. And I'm going through the list and it's like, you know, oh, Paul and Greg from Zara, Sean and Sistis, you know, these like friends that I, I knew yeah. already. And they were so excited for me to, you know, to be working for them. And, um, you know, not just because they, they were going to get business because I was going to buy from them. But I think just um, knowing that I would have that um you know that that kind of freedom to create and to work in um, in in a really cool garden and landscape. Well, and I can imagine. I mean, you guys have you guys have great horticulture over there in the Pacific Northwest to begin with. Like it's 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 its own character and everything. But I can imagine like 
that can be its own little world. And something like this is yeah. more public. So like, so I think a lot of like the gardens, like garden people go to, but this like people who just want to go to a tiki bar go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How would you describe the plant aesthetic and horticulture in the region? Like what, what defines it for you? And also how has that influenced your own thinking about plants? Oh, wow. Good question, <laughs> Carrie. Um, um, eclectic comes to mind. I mean, that's, that's certainly um, the, the approach. And I love the fact that here in the Northwest, we can really embrace diversity. Um, and, you know, uh, of course, in our gardens, but uh, also in our communities here, which is yeah, great. Okay, that's why yeah. it's been hard to leave. I'm grateful that my parents immigrated here to you know, Seattle and I, you know, have formed a career here. But that's kind of, the, you know, the, the impression where um, we can grow plants from around the world. And my hope and, you know, is that people can come to gardens here and, and relate to it. They can see something perhaps from their homeland or something that they recognize that they're familiar with. You know, even from tropical regions, you know, they'll come here and they'll see, you know, bananas and, you know, palms and that sort of thing. And they're just start scratching their head and thinking like, wow, this grows here. And um, so I think um, that's the exciting thing, you know, for me and that's sort of the motivation um, to garden is because I have this incredible, uh, palette of diversity that I get to, you know, to, to, to play with. And um, so that certainly influenced a lot of my own um, design work, uh, both, you know, in gardens and also in floral design too, being able to take these fundamental design elements, but using material that is um, um, meaningful and has cultural significance. And, um, and and it's an opportunity to sort of learn about, um, you know, like, oh, where did this style or origin or where did this plant come from? And what's the story behind this plant? So it really digs deeper. And, um, and I think when people can begin to see um, gardens as like a window into that, I think is fascinating. Yeah. That, that's, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. And I'm, I'm, I'm struck by it because I didn't, um, cause I, I wanted to talk about your floral design and I was going to wait on that, but maybe we should talk about that now. Cause this idea of that, you're like using materials that are meaningful. Um, it's an intriguing idea. So like, can you give some examples, not just with like your, your horticultural mix, but like with your floral design, how you're doing that, how, how you're using meaningful materials and how you see that and how you've mm -hmm. done it. Um, so plants and flowers and th themselves as a medium is, you know, is meaning in its life. And it's something I've committed, you know, myself to. Um, and with the floral aspect, a lot of it is influenced by the seasons. And I'm, I'm a member and a supporter of the slow flowers movement. Um, and through uh, my friends, you know, uh, in the floral industry, including Deborah Prinzing, who, um, um, you know, uh, promoted and then began this movement valuing um, the seasons and the gardens and, and the growers and the farmers that are producing these products because still most of our flowers here in the U.S. are imported and uh, most of the industry is actually reliant on those because they can get things year-round and whatnot and then all of a sudden someone like me who is a gardener um, is important because I know what's interesting and what looks good in a particular season. So right now we're still in winter and um, rather than, you know, getting most of the imports and stuff in, a lot of designers are like, oh, well, what's, you know, what's in my backyard? You know, what is available? What will hold up in a vase and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden I'm, you know, like this resource for them, which I never expected to be. And I'm just like, Oh, well, you know, well, just this and this, like, you know, of, you know, and so it's been fun to just uh, to, to share. So uh, one great example are hellebores right now. I mean, they're just, they're huge and there's, you know, they've always been popular as a garden plant, but then in the floral industry, I never realized just, you know, how, um, how hungry floral designers were for, for hellebores, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a little, you know, bizarre to me, but then all of a sudden, um, you know, people are, you know, want to grow them and how do they last in a vase and how do you use them in, in floral work and that sort of thing. And is it because so, this, this appreciation of seasonality has grown and so then they're looking for things that can express it? Absolutely, exactly. 
exactly. Um, and then in going back to your question about, you know, the meaning of different plants and whatnot, um, understanding the symbolism of it too. When I do work that, um, that's more simplistic. Um, so I'm hoping someday that I can get formal training in Ikebana and being able to embrace one of the best design principles I've ever learned in my entire life, um, both uh, in every creative endeavor that I've been in, whether it's, you know, uh, you know horticulture, folder design, dance is less is more, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you begin to break down as much uh, of the material that we can grow here and that we have available to us so easily, um, when you can simplify your design and focus on um, elements like uh, line and uh, texture, you know, that sort of thing, and, and, and choosing the, you know, the very, very simple elements where you can really pay attention to nuances within a stem, within a branch, um, within uh, a bud, you know, it's um, uh, having that deeper understanding of it. And because um, everyone thinks in floral design, it has to be, you know, the focal point, you know, the show, the in-your-face sort of, you know, uh, impact that um, the people expect from floral work. And, um, you know, that's nice and everything, but, um, but at the same time, there's so much more to it. The little nuances from the, you know, the calyxes and, you know, sepals of buds and, um, you know, the pubescence under a leaf, you know, and that sort of thing. Those are the things that, um, you know, people could care less about. But for me, I find so fascinating. But if you can take the time to, uh, to admire and to look at that and also understand their purpose too, you know, why are they there? You know, they there? You know, why is this calyx so green and, and, and frilly? What is its purpose? Um, you know, why are there hairs underneath the leaves of, uh, of, of certain plants? And um, and it's that natural curiosity about uh, about plants and flowers that we need to encourage everyone, you know, you know to, to look at. And do you feel like in the design you can create a sort of path so that people can notice these things and observe it? Um, I try to. Sometimes you just sort of create on the fly and then, uh, and you know, just Make it look pretty, call it good, you know, because then it's up to the individual to see if, how they want to interpret that. And sometimes it, you have to just make it simple. Maybe it is just one plant. It's not this whole smorgasbord of, of uh, you know, of, of different things. Um, so, you know, to really highlight, you know, what this plant is. So right now the star plant that it, uh, everyone is n uh, learning the names of right now at the garden is Edgeworthia. So it's in, oh, it's in well, bloom yeah. now. Yeah, it's in blooming now and people are so curious by it because it has no leaves and it looks like someone took little yellow, you know, pom-poms and glued them on the tips of the, of the branches. And I swear, yesterday, at least five people asked me while I was pruning, like, what is this plant? And, you know, and of course I'm like, Memorial, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my ass and like, what? <laughs> so, um, but, um, you know, they're, they're curious about it. And then of course, um, uh, you can still smell things through your mask and they know noticed it and um, we've got three huge specimens of it in this main uh, walkway in between the the courtyard and the hotel and um and just seeing people slow down mm -hmm. is is inspiring for them to look at it um and and for the little kids to just you know to kind of look up at it um is you know those little moments that um uh, that are precious and I, I i try to take a moment for myself to kind of look at that as well and um then to like to just be in awe of it well and I'm, I'm thinking about meaningful again and i and i i feel like um one of the things i love about gardening is it brings you to the moment and then like so like then those those late weeks of february early weeks of march start to have meaning because they get anchored by oh we know the Edgeworthy is blooming we know the hellebores are blooming and yeah exactly and the one thing too that's um i think reassuring for everyone and one thing i'll try and remind uh folks that uh, uh, are, are having a hard time right now uh, with, uh, you know, with their finances, with their life and their health and everything is, um, and I think one main reason why people have looked to the garden at this time of year is um, they know that it's going to be there. 
they know mm -hmm. that there is a constant that, um, you know, around January, you'll start, you know, here at least, you know, you'll start seeing, you know, things, you know, some branches popping up a few flowers. And then, yeah, like the hellebores and, you know, like we know that there's going to be the hellebores and then right, like right now the Daphne is starting to come into flower and you can't ignore Daphne Adora when it's, you know, when it's in bloom. Um, and it's something that uh, I think people can find, uh, you know, trust in and confidence and, and to know that things are going to be different and they're going to change. And when we're going to have this plant, this flower, you know, at this time of year, and it's something that they can look forward to, that they can uh, have faith in and trust. And I think, um, um, and, and many people are needing that right now, you know, including myself. It's still really intimidating for people uh, when people talk, think about gardens, because people ha still have that impression, and especially last year and everything that's, uh, that's happened with, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and all that sort of thing, where we really kind of looked at our um, um, our, our privilege and the things that we do because gardens have this history of being for the the wealthy and the and the yeah. privileged and and so I've really thought about that um, the, these last couple of months and I think it's also beginning to define uh, my approach to the work that I'm that, that I do and that I choose to do um, and, and and to have that mindset because I think even my family have always thought that I, you know, I do things that they can't, they can't really relate to. Um, I mean, if I grow food, you know, perhaps, you know, we'll have a conversation, but yeah, hellebores is worth it. Yeah, they know nothing or could care less about that sort of thing. But then like, oh, you know, so you're going to have tomatoes again, or, you know, did you plant, you know, mustard greens again, like last year, like that sort of thing. And paying more attention to that, I feel like, um, yeah, people are still thinking, oh, gardening is only for those that have money. And that's the thing too, even in our jobs, you know, uh, we, you know, we rely on clientele that have money to be able to do the work that we do. And, um, and in some ways I figured, okay, I, I, I do that and I've done that. And I reached a point where um, it's time to have a better awareness and, and to start giving back to and 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 uh, and working with communities it's hard right now because of a pandemic but working with communities and um and using language um to um to to connect with other communities to say that hey you're welcome in this space too and you're welcome to to learn um and welcome to sample and you're welcome to also make mistakes because everyone has their own path towards uh connecting with nature to have a standard you know, for us to, um, you know, uh, just sort of accept that, you know, this is the level of work and this is, uh, you know, what we should aim for. Um, but yet we, uh, we lose, you know, a community and, 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 and people um, because of, uh, of, of the standard that we, you know, that, uh, that we possess in the work that, uh, that we try to, you know, keep up. Can you um, a little bit more how you see that? Like we lose a community in the sense of, do you think it becomes too elitist and it becomes about I do, I do, and it's um, and it's something that I've never thought of because I'm, you know, trying to work through. I want to be good at what I do. I want uh, to be respected in the field, so I have to do these sort, of, you know, certain things. But in the, at the same time, I feel like I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm pushing away, you know, people from inviting them into. Uh, a space that that you know for us it's easy we're accustomed to you know the different plants and the different gardens you know our network of people etc and um, so that's what I meant that that for us it's easy versus other communities feel like they're not welcome so it's something that I uh, I really think about in terms of how I uh, communicate the work that I do and making sure that um, people are, are welcome um, to the spaces that uh, they're in. But I also have to be firm um, to make sure that they understand and to respect the places that, um, that, that I invite them in. And that's been an ongoing struggle, uh, especially with a property like at McMinimins where everything is open. Um, I'm constantly dealing with you know, kids running into planting beds and the parents letting them. It's really the parents I, get, I really get upset with, not so much the kids. And then also in our vegetable garden too, we have people that will just help themselves to the produce. And, and think, and I know where that mentality comes from because, you know, my own family, you know, like they're guilty of it. You know, when I was a kid, they were just like, oh, look, apples or whatever. Like, you know, like, hey, that's not our property. So um, finding that, um, 
uh, that middle ground and having them feel welcome, but not, you know, push them away is, is tricky, but it's something yeah. I've definitely been thinking about lately. And it's, okay. well, and it's interesting. And I, and I'm realizing as you're saying this, I think what I really like about the McMenamin's concept to me, it feels a bit like, so like back in the day, if you had like really nice, plates and really nice silverware and stuff like you only brought that stuff out for the holidays and like mm -hmm. you rarely used it and I think like gardens sometime are kept in the porcelain like cabinet and like mm. you only use it for special occasions and make metamins is like no we're gonna use this stuff every day and like people get to experience it not just in this sort of like vitrina of specialness but like mm -hmm. in 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 a more relaxed environment yeah and making it more normal and accessible i think helps spread like the appreciation of beauty generally because it makes it not not just this thing that like rich people do but like it makes it something that's for everyone yeah and i think that's what i would uh, would love to see and um and it's uh you know, it's slowly changing and that, and, you know, you can't kind of convert everyone, I guess, you know, you could say, but, but I think that's very true. And I think that's what I would definitely would love to see because, um, you know, I think for us also as a plant collector as well, I mean, and, and a plant geek, there's certain things that we really hold, you know, true and dear. I mean, gosh, if you even look at like the, the whole house plant craze that's going on right now, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother talk we could talk yeah, about. That's um, a whole, that's yeah, that's a whole other world that I just sort of watch in slight fascination. Yeah. It's just, it's fascinating. And at the same time, I'm just like, you know, I like roll my eyes at it because part of me is like, okay, I'd like, I'm over that phase, you know, but then at the same time, like you kind of have to get in there. But, um, well, uh, I but, think everyone needs different, different entry points. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's how I'm trying to approach it. You know, hopefully people, you know, they're not going to have the same journey that I have. And in some ways, I'm excited, you know, for it, um, for uh, people to have this gateway into into gardening. But as that develops, they begin to, um, you know, they want to covet the rare and then the unusual, the variegated, you know, <laughs> the, um, um, the, <laughs> the more rare, bizarre. The, unusual, the variegated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, uh, and then just so seeing that trend, then it becomes sort of like, like, oh, I have a variegated monstera, you know, Dosiosa, like, you know, that sort of thing. It just like, um, you know, you, you begin to adapt that mentality. But then at the same time, I also want to be able to communicate, like, there's also absolutely nothing wrong with just regular monstera. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, because I think it's, um, it's that whole, uh, you know, it's the Victorian, you know, era of, you know, mentality sort of deal that I think will always kind of, you know, be there. I think it's human. It is, yeah, yeah. You know, and like, it's, it's I, I think of it when I watch it sometimes, it's like hipsters being like, oh, I heard of that song before, like anyone else knew it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, pe people yeah. have that. And I, and I think, yeah. um, and there'll always be a portion of the population that finds that, very important and for some people it's just their way to get in and like generally develop an appreciation for life who knows mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, i want to yeah. talk a little bit more about your journey because you were saying like your parents and your family they don't really even like get what you're doing with your edge worthy and stuff like so like <laughs> how how did this crazy passion develop in you oh wow um Public television, let's put it that way. Really? Um, that was not yes. the answer I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, it's, well, I guess it would start. So I'm from the Philippines and I was born and raised in the Philippines until I was seven years old. So I grew up in a fruit plantation that my dad ran. So already I was exposed to, you know, uh, trees, plants, fruits. And to this day, I'm obsessed with, you know, with fruits. <laughs> um, and then... 
And then, you know, of course I saw flowers in the periphery and then, and just nature and just seeing how beautiful it was, you know, and then um, our home, you know, we had a, a backyard with a very lush, you know, landscape. And that was my playground, you know, as, as a kid, um, just, you know, wandering, um, you know, the, the, the forests and the, and the jungles and the farms that, you know, and the plantation that we were in. Um, and then, yeah, come seven years old, we moved to the United States. I didn't really speak English. Um, and then, um, I watched television and I recognized Big Bird because we had Sesame Street back in the Philippines. Okay. And then uh, all these characters sort of started coming to life. And of course, as a kid, you know, you engage and then, you know, you start singing along, et cetera. And then um, I guess I didn't know how to turn, you know, the, the, the channel the, the, the television and that's like so I just it was just all PBS basically so with that came you know um uh Galloping Gourmet you know Julia Child Jacques Pepin and then after the cooking shows or is it before the cooking shows we would have you know Roger Swain and Peter Seabrook from the Victory Garden so um huh. uh, all that sort of thing and then it um, all came because you didn't know or it didn't occur to you to change the channel <laughs> <laughs> Probably, you know, because it was just sort of like, oh, okay, more Sesame Street. And then, you know, and Mr. Rogers neighborhood, like all this sort of stuff where, you know, um, it was like, it was okay to be a kid and, 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 and to see these different things that they were sharing and, um, you know, learning to count from a vampire, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Um, but then, yeah, and then all the other shows, you know, Nature, Nova, all these sorts of things just opened up this whole sort of world. Um, and then, yeah, and then the Victory Garden and, you know, and even the cooking shows, you know, we're just all so influential and in wanting to explore. Um, and, um, and, then, um, and then just being in the Northwest too, um, you know, seeing the, in the environment around me, it was just instantly, um, you know, oh, well, like, what is that plant, you know? And, and um, you know, just kind of started from there, started going to the library and checking out books. And then, um, and then, um, uh, again, PBS, a series uh, called Gardens of the World with Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> uh, do you remember that? Have you ever seen that series? No, it's, no, I don't remember it. It's, um, uh, it, it, it I, you should check it out. It's very, yeah. you know, glammed up. And of course it's Audrey Hepburn and all these pretty gardens and whatnot, but it just opened this world because she um, went through different gardens around the world and showcasing. And then you see that they are there, that there's worlds. Yeah. Exist. They, they are, and they were just, they were magical. And I think for me as, as a kid, that was very shy, really awkward. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it was sort of an escape that these were places that, um, uh, that I felt comfortable in, that I was very curious about. And I think there was also a desire to, um, to stand out in a way where, um, like, Growing up, I feel like there wasn't, um, like I just, you know, you just feel like you're different, you know, and, and you wanted to pursue something different. And I think there was a lot of pressure as a kid, you know, again, being Asian too, you know, you were expected to do well in school and you're gonna be a doctor, you're gonna be a lawyer. Like if I do something different, you know, enough that it would come across as something like, oh, wow, like he really can be beyond and like be better, you know, mm. than that. And I kind of just embraced being, um, you know, doing something different. Really, I remember grilling myself um, and, you know, to say like, okay, I'm going to learn all the names of these, you know, plants and that sort of thing. And, and how old are you at that be, point? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Nine, 10, 11, okay. you know, okay. years old, <laughs> you know. Um, and then the moment where I began to realize that I was starting to know more than adults mm. about, you know. A, a topic then I you know began to see like oh like this like you know this could be something you know this could be um you know um you know something that I could pursue that I could really be really good at you know so you just sort of you know every avenue um that I wanted to explore and then of course I was blessed with a lot of mentors growing up who I got to meet that would um you know, uh, share their knowledge and experience that lend me or they give me their old books. Um, did you seek them out? Like, did you actively seek out mentors? They, um, as I began, you know, being interested in um, pursuing um, um, this field, I would look at different ways to, um, you know, go to like a plant show or a plant sale and, uh, and attend those and then and enter those as well. I remember being in, uh, yeah, uh, 
12, 13 years old, um, when I entered the Northwest Flowering Garden Show, they had a like garden club, a federation of garden clubs, like little competition. So think of like the, the fair where you would, you know, enter your prize, you know, uh, radish for in the weird wind blue ribbons and that sort of thing. Going back to the floral stuff, because you, you mentioned in passing the slow flower movement. Can you explain a yes. little bit more to people that don't know what that is, what that is and how you're involved? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think many people understand slow foods and that concept of um, reducing your, um, your carbon footprint to make sure that you're aware and, um, and knowledgeable about where food comes from and how it's grown, how it's sourced. So slow flowers is simply the same thing, but uh, with flowers. And um, so that's the, in a nutshell, that is, uh, that is the movement. And, um, and my, most people might think, oh, well, you know, why, you know, should we care about that? I mean, we can get flowers so much cheaper from, you know, imported and it's all about, you know, business and, um, you know, supply and demand and, you know, and uh, sourcing your materials and getting it when you need it sort of deal. So it opened up this whole realm and whole way of, of, of thinking that embraces um, a seasonality and for us as plants people, um, uh, giving us a spotlight and an opportunity to showcase the work that we do uh, because we have a better understanding of uh, of the garden, of our climate, of what grows here, and of seasonality, and what we can offer to uh, you know to people. So, uh, so it's it's interesting, and um, and 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 and, an, and a wonderful movement to be a part of. Yeah, and so I saw that you were working with the University of Washington to, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to promote this idea, promote education about it. Um, mm -hmm. How is that going? Yeah, um, uh, going pretty well. So uh, we are um, um, in planning stages uh, right now. Um, so starting to sow seeds, et cetera, and, and, and figuring out what this year is going to look like. And my role is basically sort of spearheading their cut flower program, which they never really had. It wasn't really an important thing, but it, it became a thing because it became a teaching tool for the students. Um, so why do we have flowers at the farm, you know, and, and simply asking that question. And the, of course, the answer is, well, uh, we need the pollinators, we need, um, you know, the, the birds and the bees to do their thing. So we have food. Um, and then the, um, we began to explore this idea of flowers as a, a, a crop as well. And so that's where I stepped in and, um, and with the influence of the slow flowers movement and, uh, and my own experience of just, you know, wanting to grow flowers and cut flowers um, slowly, they would, you know, we would add a row each year where I could do my flowers. And um, so then it became a teaching tool uh, for volunteers and for the students um, to, you know, get together. I'll teach them about flowers, why we grow flowers, why flowers play an important role, not just as um, pollinators for a farm, but also it's an industry and introducing them to, um, you know, the whole, you know, uh, yeah, the imported flowers versus local flowers and where flowers come from and that sort of thing. And there's many, many lessons that can be, um, that can be shared. So um, in an ideal non-pandemic realm in the last couple of years, um, we would have students come in. And, um, we would start in spring and then throughout the summer and, and towards fall where we would have um, what the farm manager uh, coined flower power hours where we, um, they would come in and learn about flowers. We put them to work either weeding or you know, deadheading or you know, just teach them something about you know, how the farm works. And then um, we would assemble bouquets for a CSA, uh, which is a, um, a, a subscription to the produce. And we basically would add, um, make little bouquets to add to the CSA. We didn't, we haven't done a separate CSA for the flowers, but um, but to understand that you know this is you know how we process flowers and you know, and all that sort of thing. And of course, there's always extra flowers. So as a conclusion and as a thank you for their help, uh, I teach them about uh, flowers and arranging flowers. So they have a little something to take home with them. Um, so we, we grow David Austin roses as a, as a crop in the mm -hmm. farm. I mean, it's not a, a great crop be, uh, to, to grow like for money <laughs> um, because it's very labor intensive and you have to, because you need the volume to, you know, to make any money to do that sort of thing. Um, plus it's a very specialty crop. But anyway, 
I love them. And so <laughs> it's an excuse to just buy more so I can plant them <laughs> at the farm. Um, uh -huh. But it's been an incredible teaching tool for us because, you know, all of them know what roses are. You know, um, it's the most popular, most recognized flower, no doubt. And then, you know, so I showed them, all right, so we're going to talk about, you know, uh, roses today. And so, uh, as you can see, these are probably ones that uh, you, you know, that you don't see at, at the market. And, um, and then I tell them about, you know, uh, whatever I feel like telling them at the moment about, uh, about what's going on. But when they're in bloom, oh my gosh, they first they think like, oh, like, this is a rose? Well, well you know. I, I, um, I cover the flower and so they just see the stem and like, okay, yeah, you know, do you recognize that it's a rose? You know, it's got the leaves, it's got the thorns, like, oh, it's a rose. So yeah, it's a rose. <laughs> but the sort of aha moment for them is when they take that rose, I hand it to them and I tell them to smell it. They don't even think to like, to, to, you know, to, to smell a rose because, the, you know, they know that, oh yeah, there's like, you know, and then they oh, smell that is it. And so it's like, sad that this generation doesn't even think to smell roses because yeah. they're these scentless supermarket. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So then, like, because oh, natural, it's a natural <laughs> human thing to, you know, to smell. So at least they know that gesture. And some will do. It's like, oh, it's a flower. I'm going to put it up to my nose. But it's the reaction after that. And they're just like, whoa, you know? And they never, and then, then I tell them that, boys and girls. <laughs> is a rose you know <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're just astounded by it so then the, the then the questions come in like you know how come the roses that we have at the you know in the flower shops in the grocery store have no scent and then again okay, then it becomes a, you know a t another teaching moment and explaining it to them and then i even get into the whole thing well yeah these david austin roses so if you're going to grow cut flowers and if you're going to invest in it um so I, you know, I showed them a stem. Now guess how much this is going to be? And they're like, oh, you know, if it's anything like the grocery store, like, oh, maybe three, four dollars a stem. And I'm like, go up, you know. And I'm like, it's harder $5, to dollars, you know. Yeah. You know, and then, um, and because it's a specialty crop, and then, and then if someone says like, okay, like ten dollars for that stem, and I'm like, yep, and I'm like wholesale you know <laughs> and um and i talk about like the wedding industry for example you know and the demand for these types of um you know luxurious flowers because you know you look at all the wedding magazines and stuff it's peonies and you know garden roses and all dahlias and all these sorts of you know beautiful flowers that then they're beginning to see that oh like people pay money for this and all of a sudden there's value in this simple stem you know that's of a rose that that's what yeah yeah so um, and then making that connection too. So they see the flower, but then now they're also looking at the plant. And I'm like, okay, so um, what does it take then to, to produce these flowers? So then we go back into you know, the farming aspect and the gardening and the horticulture aspect of it. Um, and then talking about um, you know, things like yeah, pruning and, you know, and, and, and rebloom, talking about, of course, pests and diseases and all that sort of stuff. All these things that we have to think about to produce this flower for this person or for this wedding, whatever. So they see the whole, you know, picture and much like food and, and they understand now, you know, of course with food um, uh, and they see that process and now they see that with flowers as well. So it's been the most wonderful gateway, Carrie, for, for gardening is cut flowers because everyone understands cut flowers. They see them at the grocery store. They know you put them in the vase, you enjoy them for a few days and then you, you know, then you toss them out. And so, you know, when you can get them engaged and, and hooked with just a little bit more detail about, you know, about that flower, about where that comes from. Because every time I do a bouquet, I almost see it as an opportunity for the recipient to, uh, to learn something from it. And if it's, you know, including a, a weird leaf or a, a bud of some kind, something that's you know, beyond just the focal flowers that are, that are used, um, I, you know, would love for them to notice and then, and, and, and ask about those sorts of things and find the value in those things. But, um, but it's often, you know, it's a hard sell because color and impact is, um, you know, is, is everything. So it's, it's hard to, to navigate that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But even having that as your intention is, is good. Cause I mean, flowers here, even local flowers are, are plentiful and cheap. And so, um, 
Yeah, it's, I need to visit you someday in person. It's still a dream of mine. I've never been to. <laughs> oh, you should love it. Yes, I think, think so. it. if anyone yeah. interested in flowers and horticulture, it's great. But I, but even then, like, there's definitely differences in like, yeah, um, something that's more seasonal, more ecological, and it's just so easy to be like, like we can start buying tulips all the way in January, and I'm like, Carrie, just wait till late February. You know, don't, <laughs> yeah, don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even then, like, uh, you know, we'll justify because, you know, we have tulips in like November, or just like December. And I'm like, I'm still planting them, you know. Um, but the thing is, it's you know, we like, have like playing Christmas music at Halloween, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that drives me nuts. Um, but yeah, like, but you know, we have the resources now. We have local greenhouses that you know will pre-cool their tulips, you know, way beforehand, and then get them to flower, you know, by December, January. So, like, so in that sense, you know, it's fine. But um, but yeah, there is no comparing like greenhouse tulip versus field-grown tulip. Like, there is a difference, you know, in terms of. Um, uh, stem strength, quality, saturation of color and size too. Like um, that's very evident. And um, so I'd like to think that, um, you know, and, and people rarely see that, you know, cause they don't see, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the progression of, um, of our world and the changes that take place. They see that moment. And so we, for us, it's that one moment that we have for, you know, for to convince them that this is, worthwhile and of value so um uh so yeah it's uh it, it it can be tricky but uh but yeah you're right it's um uh th there are certainly differences and it's well well, well worth the wait one well, good I example you, i have you're encouraging me to be like yeah to make to make those opportunities meaningful and not just go for like the fast food version of flowers too often like it's which you know I definitely uh, for me with the pandemic, I've been like cooking a lot more and I've been Great. mastering my broths and stuff. And, and then, nice. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and to just sort of really take that time and not just like do the impulse buy of like, oh, it's there, but to be like, okay, I would rather just have it a little less off and have a really nice, meaningful bouquet and not, and like, mm -hmm. yeah. And, have one stem, you know, like, it, and it's okay too. Like when I, um, cause sometimes when I would watch, uh, like I, I go to a grocery store, I sometimes just stop, step back and just see people like, okay, what are they looking at? What, what are they drawn to? And, um, and sometimes when I see someone younger and they'll, you know, uh, thinking of buying flowers, um, like they'll like go for like the one like single rose or like a one stem of something. And then it takes me back to thinking, oh, like, well, you know, why just one? Is it because they don't have enough money to buy the full, you know, bunch? Uh, or, you know, well, what's wrong with just getting one, you know, and having that sort of statement in you some ways, it's that whole thing where, you know, you have one stem that, you know, that's symbolic and meaningful versus, you know, a bunch, you know, that um, uh, that's like, it's almost like you're trying too hard, <laughs> you know, but with one flower, or one stem, you can make, you know, a, a, a statement. And, uh, and get a message across. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And it's uh, and and it's true. And I'm of course not the first you know person to you know to to explain that. But there are times where you know then I think back about the whole money issue because as a kid you know I didn't have a lot of money um, and um, when I save up money you know I would get you know my plants and and you know and, and buy flowers. But and then sometimes I think that maybe that's all they need. You know. Um, and it's just that one flower to either to give to someone or just for themselves to, you know, to enjoy. And one of the greatest joys that I have is to be able to give flowers away. And I buy flowers regularly. Um, and I always have this little sort of stash of them for any given moment um, that there is a, a moment that can be enhanced by, um, by you know, by flower giving. Uh, I take <laughs> advantage of it. Um, so I've been known to just keep bouquets of you know, a bucket in my car. Actually, yeah, I have some tulips right now uh, with some um, uh, plum branches in, in the car that um, like, you know, if there's an opportunity to see someone and to greet someone um, and like, those are the most incredible moments. Like when even at, at the grocery store, um, I'm, you know, buying some flowers in my groceries or whatever. And um, uh, the, the young lady that was check that was uh, cashiering, 
um, commented on the flowers and was like, oh, those are so beautiful. Like, oh yeah, thank you. You know, they just kind of have to, you know, make conversation, whatever. And then um, I don't know, uh, I th it, the, the flowers gave me a cue because it was a bunch of tulips, 10 stems, and there was like one sticking out. And then like, and I'm like, okay. So, you know, she was, you know, I was helping bag whatever and I grabbed the bouquet and I teased that, um, that little, little stem out um, and it luckily came out, didn't break. <laughs> I was afraid they're gonna break because they're gonna be brittle. <laughs> but the whole stem came out. I took off the lower leaves and, you know, said, thank you, you know, and, uh, and she's like, you know, even through her mask, you can see her eyes, you know, I just sort of like light up. Day. Yeah. And yeah. then just like, oh my gosh, this made my day, you know, sort of thing. And like, um, you know, it was just, uh, such a small gesture, but so yeah. Mean. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I just, I, I, I love the fact that that just came like to me. It wasn't like, I'm checking out the scene, yeah. you know, like, are people going to be like looking, um, you know, like, you know, it's not like I wanted, you know, I didn't like, you know, draw attention to myself that I'm making the, like this, you know, this gesture. It just, you know, um, it, like, it just felt like it was the right, you know, moment and the right thing to do. I know it's, it, it, it's fun. And, and I think it's an extension of the work that I do that, um, um, that I can at least share something, you know, not everyone can afford an elaborate, you know, floral arrangement, bridal bouquet, not everyone can have um, a, you know, desert garden, uh, rare and unusual woodland plants from Asia, like whatever it may be, not everyone can have those, uh, but they can have pieces, they can have, you know, bits and pieces that they can, um, um, they can, you know, they can, you know, take and look at that's a part of this realm as to say that, hey, you know, when the, you know, the time and place, you know, is right, this exists. And, and that uh, you're going to be welcome in this, in, in this space. You can find out more about Riz by going to his website or Instagram under RHR Horticulture. I've linked to both in the description. I've also linked to more information about Nick Miniman's Anderson School and the Slow Flower Movement. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and share it with others. And if you want to be kept up to date on our videos, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification. Thanks.